In this problem, we're going to use the first law of thermodynamics to understand the heat transfer that occurs when we put a hot object in contact with a cold object. We all intuitively know what's going to happen. The hot object is going to cool down as it transfers heat to the cold object, which itself is going to warm up. This heat transfer is going to continue and continue as the hot object gets colder and colder and the cold object gets hotter and hotter until they achieve the same temperature, which we've seen means that the molecules inside the objects effectively have the same average kinetic energy and no more thermal energy transfer is possible. We've reached a state of what is called thermal equilibrium, thermal balance, where there's one temperature now for both objects. In this case, that's going to be the final temperature of the copper water mixture. This again all relies on the idea of the first law of thermodynamics. Whatever happens to one part of the universe, well, the equal but opposite thing has to happen to the rest of the universe. We essentially just break the universe into two pieces. We've seen those two pieces are often given the names, the system, which is the part of the universe that has the interesting change that we want to figure out. And then there's going to be heat change associated with the surroundings, the rest of the universe. This has to equal zero. It's a fancy way of saying this. Q system equals negative Q surroundings. Another way of kind of talking about the first law of thermodynamics. Whatever energy change happens for our system, well, the equal but opposite energy change has to happen for the rest of the universe. Because at the end of the day, there is no change in the energy content of the universe, just where the energy is. So we're moving things in and out, but at the end of the day, the total energy is a constant. Our next problem then becomes, well, what do we call the system and what do we call the surroundings? We've got two different things, both undergoing changes that we could be interested in. Well, it turns out that doesn't really matter because as long as we define one of them as the system and the other's the surroundings and do our math correctly, it's going to work out regardless in this particular case. So another way we could think about it is the heat essentially involved for the hot object has to equal the negative heat involved for the cold object. And effectively what we've assumed is that the rest of the universe outside of the cold object really doesn't matter. In this particular case, we're not gonna worry about how much of this heat is being transferred to the air around everything that's going on. We're not gonna worry about how much of this heat is going to the moon. So essentially, in the time frame of the experiment, what we're imagining is that the heat transfer is occurring directly between these two different pieces of the universe, the hot object and the cold object. Well, our hot object is 100.0 grams of copper at 100.0 degrees Celsius. Our cold object is 50.0 grams of water at 26.5 degrees Celsius. So we've got our hot and cold object. So now we need to understand how are we going to evaluate the heat. And the question already has a bit of a hint. We've got some specific heat capacity data. I had the wrong units in there, so you'll see I've rewritten by hand the correct units that I want in there. But we've seen that any heat can be described as MCS in this case, delta T. The mass of the object its specific heat capacity, again, if we measured a mountain moles, we would use the molar heat capacity, but we'll use the specific heat capacity for this, and the temperature change that it undergoes. So it turns out that we can essentially now break this into something slightly different. The mass times the specific heat capacity times the temperature change for the water has to equal the negative of the mass, the specific heat capacity, and the temperature change for copper. That's again just throwing in MC delta T to replace Q and making sure that we define our hot and cold objects as what they are, the water and the copper. You'll notice in this case, I've kind of got them backwards to maybe how I wrote things before. 
doesn't matter. As long as we've got that negative sign in there showing there is an oppositional change. Whatever is happening to one, the complete equal but opposite thing is happening to the other. So let's rearrange this a little bit because it turns out um, that's going to be useful for us to do. First, we're going to have to take this as the mass of water. Let's say we'll divide that by the negative mass of the copper. So all I've done is bring the negative sign over and the uh, mass of copper over to the left-hand side. Uh, we could do the same for the heat capacities. The heat capacity of water divided by the heat capacity for copper. So I've just brought the heat capacity for copper from the right side over to the left-hand side as well. And then what I am going to do is I am effectively going to just leave delta T for water here for the moment. And this is all going to have to equal delta T for the copper on this side. So this is me just doing some rearranging of my equation. I can plug some numbers in here. So this is going to really simplify things for us. So we're going to have the negative. We said the mass of water is 50.0 grams, while the mass of the copper is 100.0 grams. The heat capacity for water, which I got from Table 5.1 from the OpenStack 2nd Edition uh, Open Educational Resource Textbook uh, for Chemistry, uh, which is the one we're using for the TRU 1523 course. Uh, that's 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And that we're going to divide by the heat capacity for copper, 0 0.385 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And you get a good hint as to why I kind of rearrange things this way. Because what we're going to find is that, yep, we do not need to worry about these mass units anymore or these heat capacity units. They've canceled out in the ratios. That's why I did them that way. So this is going to be minus, essentially, uh, 0 0.500. We've got half as much water by mass as copper. Big surprise. But the heat capacities of those two substances are very, very, very different. The ratio of those heat capacities is the ratio of 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius to 0.385 joules per gram per degree Celsius. What that's telling us is that water needs much more energy to change its temperature by one degree than an equivalent mass of copper does. How much more heat would water require per gram than copper does? Well, it's 4.184 divided by 0.385. In other words, water per gram requires about 10.86 times more energy to raise the temperature by one degree Celsius than copper does. Another way to think about this is that effectively for every degree of temperature change the water undergoes, if we were dealing with equivalent masses, then copper would undergo almost 11 degrees of temperature change with the same amount of heat. This is going to be really helpful for us. Again, we saw we don't have equivalent amounts, but that's why we're scaling by that ratio of masses. So in this particular case, if I just finish putting some of this stuff in here so we can really just keep on top of what's going on, we're going to find that we actually get negative 5.43. In other words, for the actual amount of copper, and the actual amount of water, we're going to see about a five degree temperature change 
for the copper for every one degree of temperature change for the water. This is gonna be useful for us because the first thing that's gonna tell us is that the copper is going to cool down a whole lot more in terms of degrees than the water is going to heat up. It's about a five to one ratio. This is useful for us because what that means of the two temperatures that we've seen in the problem, 100 degrees Celsius and 26.5 degrees Celsius, our answer is going to have to be closer to that of the water. So in other words, we're going to expect an answer that's closer to 26 than 100. And in fact, it's going to have to be a lot closer because again, it's about a five degree change for one substance for every one degree of the other. So already my head is telling me the answer is probably going to be, let's say, around 40-ish degrees. But let's see where we get to. Again, that's delta T water. And this is all going to have to equal delta T copper. Again, temperature changes can be done in degrees Celsius. Uh, the size of Kelvin and degrees Celsius are exactly the same, just different zero points. We've already talked about that in a previous video, so I won't talk about it much more. But yeah, what we're going to have to find is that's minus 5.43. I'm just going to put the negative sign in there. T final minus T initial for water. And that's going to have to equal T final minus T initial for copper. Well, something very interesting is going to happen here. Because what that means is I've got minus 5.43 TF water plus 5.43 TI of water. has to equal Tf of copper minus Ti for copper. So doing pretty well in this particular case. Well, what was that final temperature of water? We don't know. That's what we're being asked. What's that final temperature of copper? We don't know. That's what we're being asked. But what we can do is eliminate these two labels now. Why? Because the final temperature has to be the same. There's going to be heat transfer from the hot object to the cold object until we end up at some consistent final temperature for them both. So what that means is I can effectively rearrange this a little more. I'm going to move uh, the 5.43 TF to the right hand side because to make that happen I'm going to have to add 5.43. What I'm effectively going to get is 6.43 TF on this side. Well that's going to have to equal 5.43 for the TI of water And since we have on the right-hand side originally the negative Ti for copper, we're going to add to that the plus Ti for copper. Just rearranging things here. Well, what does that mean? 5.43, our temperature of the water was 26.5 degrees Celsius. To that, we're going to add the 100.0 degrees Celsius and this has to equal 6.43 times our final temperature for both objects. Let's do a little math. First thing we're going to see, the units on the left hand side are degrees Celsius, they're temperatures. That's exactly what we want. Again, we don't have to do this in Kelvin, we could, it's all going to even out in the wash. There's at least one example problem in the textbook where they say degrees Celsius instead of Kelvin in the answer. Uh, and so there's a few little places of problems there. But again, 5.43 times 26.5, that's 143 point, let's say, 9 degrees Celsius plus another 100 degrees Celsius 
that has to equal 6.43 times our final temperature. That means 243.9 degrees Celsius equals 6.43 times our final temperature, which means our final temperature equals 243.9 degrees Celsius divided by 6.43 is going to be 37.9 degrees Celsius. Let's use our intuition here. I said earlier in the video, look, for every five and a half degrees, the copper goes down. The water is going to go up one degree. So you can imagine the copper goes from 100 down to about 94 and a half. In doing that, the water would go up from 26 and a half to about 27 and a half down to about 89 for the copper, up to 28. And you can kind of go down in chunks like that. 84-ish, 29, 79, 30. And yeah, that's how I use the idea that my answer is going to be close to 40. And look, here it is. It was my intuition working for me. But here's a few tricks you can use. First, if your final temperature is lower than 26.5, what we're saying is the final temperature is lower than the coldest object we started with. That's not possible. What that means is you're likely missing the negative sign in your Q system equals minus Q surroundings. That's probably what's happened. Or you've got your final and initial temperatures backwards when you substituted them in. If you end up with a temperature over 100.0 degrees Celsius, well, that would mean the same kind of thing. You're saying everything's now ended up hotter than the hottest object you started with. That makes no sense. So that also gives you an idea to check for your negative sign, because that's usually the thing. Check for negative signs that are missing or that you've gotten your final and initial temperatures backwards in your equation. Those are the two most common ways you can end up with the wrong answer. If you found that your temperature ended up closer to 100 than it did to 26.5, you've possibly gotten your heat capacities upside down when you put them in the ratio. Because again, we saw that the water requires a whole lot more heat to change its temperature by one degree than the copper does. And we saw that the answer should be closer to the original temperature of the water. These are all little kind of intuitive tricks that you can use as you're solving problems to really wrap your head around what kind of common mistakes you could make and avoid them. But yeah, 37.9 degrees Celsius, that works for me.